Bank Nigeria is West Africa's premier bank. We have a presence in six African countries, offering diverse banking services to more than 32 million customers who speak 750 languages. We offer international banking services in London, the United Kingdom and Paris, France, as well as corresponding banking services in China. With an over 750 branch network, we serve the needs of individuals and businesses across all 774 local governments in Nigeria. We have over 11,000 employees who can communicate seamlessly in each of Nigeria's 250 languages and offer banking solutions tailored to local needs. We are committed to growing our people and the communities in which we operate. In 2020, we gave out 25,000 retail loans to pay school fees, upgrade learning facilities in schools and help businesses stay afloat, all in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have empowered 100,000 Nigerians with extra income as first money agents. All 100,000 first money agents at every nook and cranny of the nation were always on hand to serve our customers in 2020. We are investing in growth and technology and this is evident in our digital banking solutions as more than 16 million customers carry out transactions every day via our first mobile app, our first online internet banking and across 894 other channels. In 2020, we were open to our customers 24 hours a day and 7 days a week via our always-on contact centers. With our agents walking round the clock, we resolved 50,000 customer complaints across all our call centers in 2020. With 2,892 ATMs across the nation and 11 million cards, individuals and businesses were given access to cash for successful transactions. Even at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are very social with a community of over 4.2 million people across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We are continuously working to serve our customers better and to ensure that they have the best banking experience with First Bank Nigeria. First Bank Nigeria is West Africa's premier bank. We have a presence in six African countries, offering diverse banking services to more than 32 million customers who speak 750 languages. We offer international banking services in London, the United Kingdom and Paris, France, as well as corresponding banking services in China. With an over 750 branch network, we serve the needs of individuals and businesses across all 774 local governments in Nigeria. We have over 11,000 employees who can communicate seamlessly in each of Nigeria's 250 languages and offer banking solutions tailored to local needs. We are committed to growing our people and the communities in which we operate. In 2020, we gave out 25,000 retail loans to pay school fees, upgrade learning facilities in schools and help businesses stay afloat, all in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have empowered 100,000 Nigerians with extra income as first money agents. All 100,000 first money agents at every nook and cranny of the nation were always on hand to serve our customers in 2020. We are investing in growth and technology and this is evident in our digital banking solutions as more than 16 million customers carry out transactions every day via our first mobile app, our first online internet banking and across 894 other channels. In 2020, we were open to our customers 24 hours a day and 7 days a week via our always-on contact centers. With our agents walking round the clock, we resolved 50,000 customer complaints across all our call centers in 2020. With 2,892 ATMs across the nation and 11 million cards, individuals and businesses were given access to cash for successful transactions. Even at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are very social with a community of over 4.2 million people across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. 
we are continuously working to serve our customers better and to ensure that they have the best banking experience with First Bank Nigeria. Are you a business owner? Been in business for a minimum of 12 months? Would you like to earn extra cash by offering financial services to people in your community? Then, join one of the fastest growing business communities in Nigeria. Become a First Money Agent. As a First Money Agent, you get to enjoy so much that the brand has to offer. Grow your social relevance as First Bank Financial Agent in your community with business expansion possibilities due to increased awareness for your existing business and increased patronage too. Also, you get to earn extra income via commissions from transactions processed from being a First Money Agent. To enroll as an agent, visit www.firstbanknigeria.com slash personal banking slash ways to bank slash first money or visit any First Bank branch to get started. A First Money agent can serve every Nigerian. Service offerings include cash deposits, cash withdrawals, funds transfer, airtime top-up and bill payments, account opening, BVN enrollment, and so much more. What are you waiting for? Partner with us. Become a First Money agent today. You first. First Bank. Good morning, esteemed ladies and gentlemen. You're warmly welcome to the 2021 First Bank Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability Week. My name is Timmy Tokwe Shawande, and I'm honored to be your host for today. Kindness and consideration for others is an essential virtue, and we at First Bank believe that it should be a way of life. The topic for our webinar this morning is titled, Education, Does Kindness Have a Role? And I'm sure we all are waiting and eager to hear from our guest speakers and panelists, their insights and perspectives on this topic. We also have our SPARK initiative. SPARK is an acronym for Start Performing Acts of Random Kindness. And I'm sure you'll hear a bit more about this during the course of the session. To set the ball rolling, we will be having a welcome address from our CEO and the group exec and our chief executive officer of the First Bank Group. He's also uh, a managing director of the bank and subsidiary. And so please welcome with us our CEO, Dr. Adishola Kazim Adedotong. Over to you, CEO. Good morning, colleagues. Um, let me start um, by congratulating each and every one of us uh, again for the opportunity that we have to host another CRNS week. Um, my pleasure to welcome each and every one of us to this uh, week, uh, which has now become a very important um, part of our corporate calendar. And that basically speaks to the institution that we have and what we are seeking to achieve, um, which is essentially emphasizing the fact that profitability to us is very important, but being a good corporate citizen is equally extremely important to the institution. Even though last year, because of the COVID pandemic, we couldn't hold um, our traditional uh, corporate responsibility and uh, sustainability week. We indeed did extremely well because again, it's not about uh, publicity, it's about what is in our DNA, which is to ensure that we continue to be an integral part of the society where we operate. As a number of us will recall, um, because of COVID-19, and the, the devastating impact it had and is still having, 
on the economy. First Bank team up with other private sector leadership to float CACOVID, which is the private sector coalition against COVID. And we indeed work together to provide and support government in the area of provision of uh, isolation centers, drugs, medication. And on top of that, most importantly, we provided food for 1.7 million families across the nooks and crannies of the country. That we did jointly with other members of CACOVID. But as an institution, noting the fact that the educational sector, especially the children were being left out of the old COVID palliative team. We were, we set aside an objective of working with uh, other stakeholders to migrate about 1 million students to virtual learning platform. And in this regard, our partnership with Lagos State, um, our partnership with IBM, our partnership with Microsoft, and other organizations speaks volume about who we are and the kind of impact that we do make. For the purpose of this uh, 2021, our team is kindness, a way of life. And for us, it, um, it reflects our single-mindedness, the purpose of our SPAC initiative that seeks to make a difference. Yesterday, I was with the leadership of Lagos State Government uh, where we are working with them to put up a primary health center in a very remote part of Lagos. I'm sure a number of us will not even know they are part of Lagos that are rural and without um, some of the basic amenities that we take for granted. I was with the um, GE Corporate Banking and the Group Chief Compliance Officer, among others. Uh, of course, the MNCC team were there with us where we made that commitment on your behalf. Throughout this week, um, there are a couple of things that we'll be seeking to do um, for us to engage um, our community. Uh, there's a kind comment day, visit to orphanages and the home for the less privileged, spark school engagement. I've referred to the grand breakfast ceremony for the health center and we're being there series. The most important thing I want us to take away from this is the fact that we want kindness to become a way of life and we want first bankers to exemplify that. There was a Roman philosopher that said that wherever there, is, there are human beings, that means there's an opportunity for kindness. So if you just choose to be kind to, the, to your neighbor, to your colleagues at work, we can all collectively make the country, the bank, the environment where we live, the town where we stay, we can all collectively make it a better place for everyone. Collectively, I would believe we will discover the power of kindness, which lies in his special ability to touch and change lives. The reality of the world is um, we, have, we belong to a privileged class. There are people that are much more less privileged and our show of kindness to them will go a long way for giving them, providing them with a sense of belonging and a sense of hope that ensures that uh, they have something to look forward to. Once again, um, we solicit the support of all our staff for all of us to make a difference in the lives of the less privileged, irrespective of where we're domiciled, irrespective of our religion, our faith, our geography. It's just so important to show kindness to the less privileged. Thank you. And I wish each and every one of us a very successful week. Thank you very much, CEO, for the welcome address. At this point, we want to bring on our first guest speaker who will share her perspectives on kindness as well. And our guest speaker is none other than Mrs. Fola Shade Adefisai, the Honorable Commissioner for Education in Lagos State. 
Mrs. Adefisayo is the principal consultant and CEO of Leading Learning Limited, an educational consultancy incorporated in the year 2014. Since she started her own consulting practice, she has consulted for public and private schools, state government, NGOs, and development partners. Her areas of professional focus include teacher training, leadership training, school setup, and school transformation. She has nearly 40 years working experience, spanning the banking operations, organizational restructuring, human resource management, international trade, and education. She is currently the Honorable Commissioner for Education in Lagos State. A warm round of applause to welcome Mrs. Fola Shade Adefisayo. You have the floor, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, management of First Bank. I, I thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this. And I, I, in giving this address, it's going to be very short because I do want to hear what other people have to say. I think it's more interesting to listen than to do all the talking yourself since you hardly know everything. So I thank you. When, when I was asked about this, I was quite intrigued. And so I tried to find out um, quotations on kindness. And of course, we all know inherently what kindness is, maybe doing good to our fellow human being. But I wanted to go a bit deeper than that. And um, the first uh, quote I got, I really enjoyed. It was from the Mind Journal. And it said, kindness is a, a, a noun. It, 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 it uses it as a noun, because it can be a verb, of course, which is a doing thing. What the noun says, loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness, which I totally enjoy because it is saying, you give out of what you have, you give out of the positives in you. That is kindness. That is why when, uh, as a school principal, I used to tell my students, I don't feel it's wonderful for you to give people your old clothes that you don't wear anymore. You don't want them anyway. You can do that, but that's good. But why don't you give of something that is your strength, something inherent, something within you? And so that is why I would give more by service than by physical giving. So loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. And the other thing, the other quote I loved was, do things for people, not because of who they are or what they do in return, but because of who you are. And so uh, being kind to people because of yourself, because, because that means that you know that it's the right thing to do. And you do it whether you'll be rewarded or not, whether people will say thank you to you or not, whether people will appreciate it or not. It is just doing it because it is just the right thing to do. So I uh, haven't looked at those two quotes, among millions I imagine, I totally enjoyed it. And then I said, well, this is very thoughtful and intriguing. Yes, I, I like this comment that it is, is uh, active and doing. Mr. Abiola, thank you. Yes, it is a noun because it says loans your strength in that uh, context. But it is a verb because action, action is always better than just description. And so that's why I went to the other thing to that as a noun is loaning your strength and so on. But it's a verb because you are doing things for people. So in that context, it, it tries to look at both sides the description of the act and the act itself. So I thought this was so intriguing. This was so thoughtful. This was so interesting. So interesting of First Bank. I said, why would any corporate organization interested, of course, as the MD said, and frankly, in the profit motive, because of course you have to make a profit. If you don't make a profit, you won't be sustainable. If you are not sustainable, you cannot be kind even, because you won't even have the resources with which to give. So I totally appreciate the profit move motive. And I'm wondering that how interesting that this large behemoth, this, this bank that has been like forever, as a former banker, a young banker uh, myself, I started work in UBA many years ago. First bank was then the biggest bank in Nigeria. 
and it has maintained and retained that great position. And he didn't do it just by being kind. So I said, mm, did they do it by being kind at all or just following the profit motive? I won't argue over that. I will just say that at this point in time, it's intriguing, it's interesting, and also very, very thoughtful that they've gone back to say, look, let us be kind. I've not seen this as a value proposition in many corporate organizations. I've looked through honesty, integrity, the profit motive, uh, you know, a customer centered and so on. But I have not seen that word, kindness. So I, I must say that in corporate Nigeria and, and Globally, I imagine we must say a big thank you to First Bank for thinking about this different way it's giving. But in giving, probably if you, you know the saying that when you give, you probably get back a lot more. For instance, if you are a mentor, you are giving of your intellect, you are giving of your time, you are giving of so much, your knowledge, and all these are priceless. You are giving it to somebody. But what you get in return is also priceless. You have a relationship with a young person. You have a relationship with somebody whose whose future is is, is 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 open and great and long and therefore you 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 have the pleasure of watching that flower unravel i think you got more from that mentorship relationship than the mentor so in giving the person who gives gets a lot out of it as well because these things are unquantifiable and so I, I, I thought that was great. And I thought great enough again was that they are starting from home. Hmm? They started this uh, Spark project where their own staff you know, are required to be kind. And I would like to say this to those of us who are customers of banks. Being kind does not mean that you are not firm or that you are not uh, doing the right thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that because you are kind, people will be able to push you to do what you shouldn't do. No. Being kind means are judging the situation and giving of your best to people. It's not to give of your best so that you, 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 you bank as a good corporate citizen. And for Lagos State, I will say this, that you've done for us some quantifiable. Uh, the MD mentioned it during the lockdown, apart from the fact that um, they gave food and so on to people. In the Ministry of Education here, we had a fantastic relationship with First Bank. They actually kicked off the donation of uh, devices for our students, and they gave us the bulk of the devices that we got. These devices we gave to our students, and you don't know what you have done. We gave the devices on which we had uh, uploaded our curriculum schemes of work, uh, teachers' lectures, drawings, also illustrations and so forth, to children who would ordinarily never have access to such. We gave it mostly to, because you followed us around too. You gave it out to customers in river, uh, to schools and children in river line areas, remote communities. And like you said, many people don't know that Lagos does have rural, uh, communities to our rural communities. So children in these communities have access to, a, to, 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 to learning on this device. And added to it, you were able to negotiate um, uh, data for them as well, so that they constantly have access to data. The only problem we've had is that in some of these remote locations, there is no, um, what can I call it? There is, there is no uh, uh, access. And so we've been working with other people to, to deploy remote servers so that they, once they have this uh, device, they can up, upgrade this when they want. But even without the uh, data, what is on the phone itself is more than enough for them to learn, to, to learn on a day-to-day -day basis. So we are very excited with that relationship. And I thank First Man, they did a lot more. I'm just talking about the Ministry of Education, what we enjoyed from them and uh, the unforgettable thing that you've done. You have turned around the life of uh, the lives of many children, children who would not have had access, children who would not have been able to study. And I will give you this, that in our study, and, and you know, you link this to a web page as well, so that students who had access were able to go online, those who didn't have had devices. And I will tell you that from the study that we did, the students who had the best results 
uh, in those areas where they used the online resources best, that is in the public school system. So I say thank you very much. Your kindness has yielded more than you can ever conceive or know. And that is why kindness, like I said, you get, get more. Because what you have gotten now is the everlasting gratefulness of a number of people. And also the fact that you have turned around societies. Who knows what these children will become in future? So we say thank you. Uh, it's clear that First Bank understands the need for us to be kind, especially to the most vulnerable, to people who are not going to be able to pay you back in kind or cash. To people who, 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 who can even for, for, for ages. So I, I thank First Bank for thinking about this. Like I said, I'm not here to go on and on and on, but um, it's more important to listen than to talk. So I thank you very much for inviting me. I consider it a singular honor because um, it, it's something, and I, I because this is not something I, I had sat down to think about. I just work, but I now see that um, you do your work, but if you fuse this great concept into deliberately and intentionally, and not by happenstance or chance, you are probably likely to be more successful. So I wish you successful deliberations. I thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to all that is going to happen today. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Indeed, she has told us that uh, kindness can be both a noun and a verb. And we appreciate you too, ma'am, for attesting to some of the things that First Bank have started to do with our Spark initiative and even just supporting what we say we want to do. As we move on now, we would have to have a, a brief talk from our keynote speaker from today. And let me just read her biography as she comes up. Our keynote speaker today is Professor Lees Grant. Professor Lees Grant is an assistant vice chancellor at the University of Edinburgh and Professor of Global Health and Development. She's a director of the university's Global Health Academy, responsible for developing and supporting global health partnerships for local and global advocacy. Lise is a co-director of the Global Compassion Initiative, a university-wide initiative to embed a culture of compassion and care across all colleges and to support the science of compassion studies. She leads the palliative care in a changing climate group, working to develop palliative care services in fragile states and refugee settings. Lise is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. She sits on the Scottish government's NHS Global Citizenship Board and is also a steering group member for the organizational health information for all. Previously, Lise was a senior health advisor to the Scottish Government's international development team, working primarily in Malawi. She has worked for the UK's National Health Service in the Public Di Health Directory and led the NHS HIV partnership between NHS Lobbyan and the Zambian Ministry of Health. She has been an advisor to a number of global health charities and serves as a trustee for CBM Scotland. Please welcome with us Professor Lee's Grant. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. And also it's been inspiring already to hear the words of the CEO and the, the words of the Honourable Commissioner for Education. Um, thank you so much. So um, over the next uh, few minutes, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the extraordinary ideas of kindness and the work of the SPARC program and also to think about sharing those lessons um, sharing the lessons that I've learned by understanding more about Spark actually into the University of Edinburgh but also thinking as a global community of scholars as a global community of bankers as a global community of people together kindness really matters I'm going to um, share some uh, a PowerPoint uh, and and talk um, alongside it, if that's okay with you all. And here, I hope you're seeing it coming up. Uh, please let me know if everything uh, is working. So one of the things I wanted to actually start thinking about is 
all of us together for a purpose. And I think we've already talked about purpose um, as we've started this um, webinar. And every day we have a purpose. And every organization has a purpose. And what's striking is at present, particularly in the words of Dr. Tedros, who's the Director General of the WHO, the world is out of balance. It sometimes feels as if the whole world has lost its purpose. In fact, the world's in quite a dangerous place at the minute. Not just the pandemic, though the pandemic has really caused all of us to be challenged, but also the climate change crisis we're in, the economic downturn caused by the, the pandemic, the conflicts across the world. There's a real sense that we are losing values. We're, we're losing our morality. We're losing what gives us purpose. So what's extraordinary as we think about kindness, we actually begin to think, how can an understanding of kindness as a noun, as a verb, as a way of being, how can that begin to transition us back, back, help us tilt the world to the place we know it needs to be? This, I've just captured a few words from the Spark Kindness Manifesto, and I'm sure you're all actually really familiar with the Kindness Manifesto, but it is extraordinary because what you have here is a way of living. It's a charter of making the world a better place. It's a charter of purpose. We believe kindness should be endless. What an extraordinary vision, a sense of a, a future, a hope. And I want to pick out these three words because I'm going to talk very specifically about one of them as we talk about kindness. Everyone deserves to be treated with civility, compassion and respect. And there's something else in this around kindness and generosity, that sense that there's more to life than what we see. And if we if we give, I, I love the words of the Honourable Commissioner talking about um, loaning someone our strength, giving to others, giving and receiving. World can be a better, warmer, kinder place. So let me think about a little about making kindness a way of life and thinking about compassion, civ civility and charity. These will determine the future. But if you think about compassion, to start with, compassion is a very complex idea. Kindness is actually a very complex idea. It can be seen as a, an approach, as a tool, as a way of being, a type of action, a construction. And the word compassion, which really sort of in a sense gives kindness its, its, its momentum, it is from two words, from the Latin com and the old French and passion. And com means with or together. And I think this is so essential as we think about kindness, togetherness. But the other part of that, passio, passion, actually means suffering. And in one sense, we stand back because do we want to be together with suffering? That seems quite a hard thing to ask all of us to consider. But it's why I started saying that the world is in a difficult place. The world is out of balance because the world is suffering. And we've been reminded already there is a lot of suffering in all our countries. And there's something we can do something about. There's something we can, suffering that we can act upon. Compassion and kindness is love and action. It's part of your manifesto. And I want to use the words of Martha Nussbaum, the American philosopher, and thinker who, who said, she spoke of the importance of cultivating the ability to imagine the experience of others and then to participate 
in their sufferings. And there's something about kindness that actually asks us to cultivate the ability to imagine what someone else is going through. Throughout this talk, I'll talk about kindness being work, needing work. Kindness doesn't just happen. And yet, with all of us, in all of us, there is the capacity to be kind. There's the opportunity to be kind. And kindness, when it happens, changes the world. There's four components to the concept of compassion. And I, I feel these four components also are so, are, they're very much the determinant of kindness. Because sometimes I think kindness or compassion could be seen as, you know, showing pity, but it's not. And that's actually been emphasized this morning. It's not about pity. It's about something very, very different, something quite extraordinary and remarkable. Monica Warline and Jane Dutton, um, organizational psychologists, wrote a book called Awakening Compassion at Work. And they described the process of compassion and they described it in four parts. And I think this is what your manifesto does as well. They described it, first of all, as a noticing. When we be kind, we actually also notice the other. We notice there is something that could happen, needs to happen. And particularly in compassion, we notice pain and suffering. We notice there's a problem. But we, not, we don't just notice it. We actually interpret it. And what do I mean by interpreting suffering? I mean, actually thinking, what is this other person going through? What is lying behind how they're feeling? What, what's causing someone to look down? Or what's causing someone to be angry? Or what's causing something to not go right? Interpreting it. And then feeling empathetic concern. Feeling a real sense of, I care. This matters. This affects me. And finally, and this is a bit that I think kindness comes in fully, acting to alleviate the suffering. Compassion is about action. Noticing, interpreting, feeling, action. Taking these things together are absolutely critical. This is where it begins to make a change. And kindness, I think, is an, it's an innate in all of us. We, we have the capacity to be kind. It's, it's in our very being. I want to just touch on the science of compassion just a little bit more, the science of kindness. You know, at a very reductionist level, we might actually say compassion or kindness like, like memory is, is almost like a, a cell to, to cell interaction in the brain. And we know that memories define us. They inform our interactions with the world and other people. They, and memories are formed, they're retained, and they're actually lost through neuronal plasticity. But I, I wonder if we can think of compassion in this way, because there's a number of scientific studies, particularly over the last 20 years, that are really showing us that there's something very significant about compassion and kindness. It, it feels as if it's hardwired into our brains. It's a product of genetic predisposition, of cultural exposure. And this becomes really important as we think why we should be kind. It's about life experiences, all somehow coded in the complexity of the billions of neuronal interactions in our brains. And interestingly, Darwin, in 1871, when he was writing, uh, his work on uh, the descent of man, he, he, he actually des effectively described kindness and compassion. He called it sympathy. Uh, um, but he was talking about, he said, when communities which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic or kind members will flourish the best and they'll rear the greatest number of offspring. It's quite interesting that Compassion has been identified oh, and kindness right through from early, early systems, generations and generations back. 
our ancestors knew kindness matters. They knew it was part of who we were, how we were to, to function. And indeed, work from a number of studies is actually really showing that you can scan in the brain and you can see if someone is um, subjected to pictures that show kindness and then look at their brain action, there's, there is a reaction in their brain. So watching someone else be kind actually stimulates kind, a sense of kindness in ourselves. Um, and that's from early childhood. Children watching others being kind are kinder. Children watching cruelty or seeing someone who's in need feel sorrow. You can, it, they, they're tearful. And then they, there's a reaction in children, very young children, that they respond in a sense, watch the child. That shows us the future. So let's think about this kindness and compassion in, a, in our place in the world and with purpose. The sustainable development goals that we're all familiar with, and in a way, children today, young people, our adults, our older people, all of us are impacted and affected by the sustainable development goals. And in the future, our education is, is driving forward how we're going to respond to the goals. Now, in the preamble to the goals, there are some beautiful words, because the preamble talks about the healing of the nations. It's an extraordinary expression. And I wonder, as we think about that, and as we think about the SDGs, because each of the SDGs, these Sustainable Development Goals, actually call out suffering. And they call us to do something towards suffering. They call each of us and our systems, our organisations, our banks, to be responsive to the suffering. And to do that, to heal the nations through acts of kindness, through compassion. Something very ex extraordinary about that phrase and that phrase also in the preamble about leaving no one behind and in a way that's what kindness does it allows us to notice who is being left behind who is not part who's not being brought forward together and I love the the message from the CEO that the cl that, that clinic was being um, put to uh, is built in the very rural part of Nigeria this sense of we need to be together we need to notice who's being left out. Dr. Tedros, I've already mentioned, Dr. Tedros said something else and it, in the World Health Organization that I think applies to us as we think about kindness as well. Because he, he talked about kindness and compassion in the context of quality. And if quality is the marker of all our work, kindness and compassion allows us to get to quality because it challenges us. Kindness is not just about what we do to another or what we do to ourselves. I think it's what we, how we approach our lives. Are we approaching our lives so that we offer the very best of ourselves and we ensure that everything we do is the best because that is a marker of kindness. You talked about quality not being a given. It takes vision, it takes planning, investment, compassion, meticulous ex execution, rigorous monitoring and that is a, that is you know how I think not just in health but in finance in agriculture in the food industry everything if we're working to those goals and that vision something happens but it asks us to think what are the ethical principles by which we live and this is what the kindness manifesto this is what spark calls out where are our values because we can't turn on kindness just as if it, it, it happens without a background, without a motivation, without an investment. Where are our values? And how do we value ourselves? And how do we value others? And do we value our values? Because it's not enough to say, oh, I have these values, I have values of honesty, integrity, you know, I have values of care, but do we really value those as well? Do we say that I will ensure that they stand up? I will work for those values. We need to work towards them. We need to be um, creative in the way that we design 
how we live. We need to be thinking about our approaches every day. And compassion, kindness takes training. But it also means that it can be taught. We can invest in others. We can invest in ourselves. We can bring about change. And here I want to, it's a busy slide and I apologize for that, but I want to just say that this is why education is so important. And I think this is why what, what's happening in Spark is extraordinary because kindness, I believe, can be taught. It's innate but it can be taught, but it, the teaching is really about a nourishing, a developing and allowing to flourish. And I want us to think about for a moment, how do we see our students? How do we see our young people who are our future? Do we see them as change makers of the future? Do we, do we and Spark, we recognize in Spark that if young people have the gift of kindness, then their change making in the future will be powerful because they will bring those values forward, working together principally and principled. Do we see them as change makers in the present? I hope so, because young people are change makers in the here and now. And that is why our education in the here and now is also so very vital. We're not just training leaders for the future. We're recognizing that as young people are acting in and off each other together, their little actions, all of their huge actions matter. And do we see young people as individuals with their own capabilities, their dreams, their wisdom, their potential, and how if kindness is, is almost the, the knitting all of these together, what does that look like? But as we see students and young people, we need to think, where are they in our schools or organizations? And do our schools, our universities, our banks, do we see ourselves as institutional change makers with a purpose to transform society? And do we see ourselves as modeling? Are our schools modeling this different way of functioning in the present? in order to get to the future that the Sustainable Develops, Development Goals talks about, the healing of the nations. Are we modeling this now? It makes such a difference to, to, to think about these things. What, for the next couple of slides, I just want to talk about what this work is then. We can talk about this is what we need, but what is the work of kindness? And how does that relate to each one of us? The work, I'm going to divide it into five just short pieces. Kindness is interpersonal work. Kindness does, does not just happen. We can really nurture kindness and social institutions can construct the shape of kindness. We can make a difference in how that shape is constructed because as interpersonal work, it's about how we be with other, others. It's about the skills and competence to be kind. It's ensuring that our ourselves and our institutions are modeling the value of kindness. And it's about being intentional, actively being intentional. But kindness is also a narrative. And what I mean by that is that we carry the words of kindness in our language. We carry the words of kindness in our speech. We carry them in our stories of the past, our stories about how, what we tell about each other. What's it like to start to think about stories of kindness that we can share together so that we know those stories will move forward. They'll become what defines us as a bank, as a university, as a school, as a community of practice because those stories are about our identity. And if those stories have a thread of kindness, then something happens, something changes in and of ourselves. Kindness is the tool of education. It's not just about kindness being a subject within education. It's not just that there is a science of compassion and kindness. Kindness is the tool within which we teach, the tool of, of, of conveying messages the tool of understanding what it's like to relate to each other. Kindness as organizing, 
And I don't know whether we think about kindness as organizing very much, but how we organize ourselves, how we approach others, changes the way that we function in our work every day. It changes in the way in which we teach every day. It also changes the way in which students receive knowledge. There's something about ensuring that our values of kindness are aligned with our vision, also aligned with the processes by which we call for kindness, also aligned about the legit legitimacy of, of being kind. And one of the things that was extraordinary at the start of the COVID pandemic, particularly during the lockdowns, was that in every country we saw extraordinary acts of kindness. It was as if people had been given permission to do what they wanted to do all along, permission to be kind, it, to be giving to others. In a, and, and that's something that I think we can carry forward, legitimizing kindness, not taking it for granted, but actually ensuring that across our organizations and schools, there is the, not just the moments to be kind, but kindness becomes the norm. It becomes the way that we are fully present to another, the way we be with each other, the way we dream about the world. Kindness, I'm going to argue, fills the spaces between. We're in a strange place. I've always been a strange place in the world because the world functions with division, segregation, separation, nation states and nation states. We and not just nation states, communities and communities. Um, we just look around our houses, our workplaces, we see separation and separation has a value. It creates the boundaries and the perimeters and um, allows us to, to function. But there's something about the different spaces that are in our lives and in our systems that we want to think about where kindness can, can make a difference. Some of that is around how we, be in our professional life, our personal life, and our private life? Does kindness come through all of those? We sometimes can be very kind in our personal life, but actually go to work and suddenly become a different person. Kindness is about the drawing together our personal, our private, our professional life, and ensuring that it, kindness becomes the thread that knits them so that we are authentic, we appear to other as others as we are. There's something about the values of society and what societies value, what society values, because we can talk about the values of society and kindness being one of those values that we want to give to society. We want society to, to recognize. There's, but it's so important that we think about, is there a, a juxtaposition? Is there a difference between what society values and what are the values embedded in society and if there is how can we call that out how can we ensure that the values become um, appropriate and honest and that there is an integrity of the values of society and we can do that and spark does this by the momentum of kindness seeping through everything from institutions organizations the way people are to each other Kindness also helps us think about the spaces between environment, organization and activities. And I want to emphasize that because in the crisis we're in with climate change and the constant warming of our planet, being kind to the environment matters hugely. That is going to become one of our biggest challenges in kindness, kindness to each other and kindness to the planet, respect, dignity, recognizing. What does that mean? What does that look like? Because our planet is suffering the same way as we are suffering. The droughts, the floods, the rains, the landslides, the, the, the rising temperatures, the, the fires, our planet is suffering. What can we do and how can we marry these spaces together again through kind action? A single, a single act of kindness, multiplied and magnified and multiplied again, can bring change. And kindness is in filling the space between ourselves and others. And that's an important space because 
all of us will know that we do something called othering. There's people we like, there's people perhaps that we think, I don't want to speak to them, I don't want to know them. They're not my people. Let's stop, let's think. How can we draw in this space between people? How can we fill that space so that we're not looking at others with contempt or pity or arrogance, but actually looking at others as a human being, one of our, one of us, we are humanity together. These are little exercises that for being compassionate and kind, exercises that the SPARK pro programme has really tried to embed. It's about greeting. It's about how we are, how we speak to each other. It's about, and greeting's important. Uh, and I think it's something that in the UK and Scotland, we don't do well enough. Something that you, you, do so much better we need to think about greeting because it's that moment when you meet somebody it's that moment that we bring ourselves into another's presence how do we greet so that the person feels that we are greeting them or recognizing them we are giving them their identity we are honoring their presence something about all and that may seem strange kindness and all but what i mean is to be able to stand back and think what an amazing place we're in. What an amazing planet. What an amazing humanity together. And because of that, it allows us to, the, the kindness to well up. We think we have the gift of life and it's extraordinary. Something about curiosity and kindness. Because if we're curious and they're coming back to the noticing, interpreting, we begin to go further. We begin to ask, what's happening here? Why is this person sad? What's what, why is that happened? And not just why is a person sad because they don't have um, the food, but why do they not have the food? What's happened before that's made them to get into this position? What's, what systems crisis are there that's meaning that some people have food and some people don't? Curiosity drives us with a compassion agenda. Then there's something about replenishment because in giving, we also need to understand that we need to take. We need to take or in and off ourselves. We need to take care. We need to replenish ourselves. And sometimes that replenishment to be kind is just to stand outside and enjoy nature. Sometimes it's to read, to listen to music, to experience our faith, to share. We all have our ways of replenishing. Replenishing ourselves is about being kind to ourselves and it allows us to be kind to others. The giving joyfully and rejoicing in our shared common humanity is also about being recognizing that we giving is not a sacrifice, it is a gift, as, as the Honorable Commissioner said earlier, and the CEO. It's about sharing. There's something wonderful as we're part of that giving, loaning of our services to others, because that's the very best we can give. Being fully present intentionally present not just whizzing by somebody and saying something but actually listening and listening is such a key word in kindness listening to hear looking watching where touching sometimes holding someone's hand i know the pandemic has changed that but those are the things that can matter hugely being fully present and we know when we see someone fully present to ourselves we come away and we feel different, but each of us are in our capacity. Each of us can do that. Receiving and joy. So there is something about giving, but there's also something also to be able to receive. And that's quite a hard thing sometimes. I know many people who are very kind sometimes struggle to have kindness shard on them. Something to think about. Do we also receive with joy? Staying focused. And what I mean, by being focused is being being intent in what we do being courageous in our kindness because just being nice is not about being kind or compassionate but kindness and compassion actually asks us to call out injustice it asks us to challenge and be curious of what is wrong to take action it asks us to be focused on the the goal of kindness to make the world a better place and taking the time to pause. And that's really important sometimes if we're in a situation where we feel 
I'm frustrated or I'm angry or I don't understand what's going on. Sometimes it's so important just to step out and that can be the kindest thing for a moment and think, what should I do? Calm myself and let me be kind going in. You know, leanness and leanness is important in organizations, but leanness isn't meanness. We can be lean, we can call to account, we can be calm and kind together. And in the last few slides, let me just show you this picture of an iceberg. Now, the problem, and I'm very aware in, in, in our uh, situation of climate change today, there's a real concern about um, icebergs and, and ice melting. But the reason I'm showing this is that there's, we have spent a lot of time chipping away at the top. And, a lot, and in some ways, the sustainable development goals just do that. They chip away at the top of the iceberg. If we're trying to remove this iceberg, we're constantly chipping at the ice. But we know that actually the way that spark works isn't about chipping at the ice, it's doing something different. Effectively, if you can think of this image with me, spark puts warm water around the iceberg. It melts the iceberg. Works so much more effectively than chipping away at the top. There's something here, and I'm, I'm conscious of that Im the image now in the context of icebergs is challenging with climate, but there's something here about thinking Kindness does something different than just doing particular activities. Kindness is about activities done with warmth. It's about the warm water that, that removes what we're trying to remove. It's the warm water that flourishes what we're trying to flourish. Kindness means so many things. And it's good to almost think what all of those things does it mean to you is about being fully present, about a sense of a belief in, a celebration of a common humanity, interactive meaningfully, being authentic. So many words come into that. Just one la or two last thoughts. Instead of the future student community, and actually, to be honest, the future of organisations, particularly students, though, young people, you'll need three things for the future. Curation, creativity, and compassion. Curation because there's so much knowledge out there, there's so many systems out there. You have to have the skills to bring them together, to curate knowledge. That's a huge skill and it's a huge skill in banking, it's a huge skill in every discipline. The skill of creativity, of thinking differently. Our world is rapidly changing. How do we think differently? How do we be creative with what's happening and constantly allow, be dynamic. And how do we be compassionate and kind? Those three skills are said to be the three skills that will change the world. There are the three skills that we need for the future. There's the three employability skills. They make such a difference. So finally, I want to end with the, the words of um, William Shakespeare, who was writing, 1596, 1599, in this, this particular play, The Merchant of Venice. And there's a, a, there's a beautiful line in it that I think really captures something about the wholeness of kindness and compassion. And it's actually using the word mercy, which again is really in this sort of grouping of words. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. And I want to leave you with that thought because there's something in this that is about a gift. There's something about relationships, about blessing of the one who receives, the one who gives, they're together. It's something about reciprocity in kindness, a togetherness as well. There's something very redemptive about kindness. It calls us to think about who we are in relation to the other. It calls us to redeem ourselves, to think around and redeem others, to think about that value that we place in the world. There's something wonderfully restorative 
the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It's that sense of going across everything. It's that sense that kindness begats kindness. It brings more and more kindness. But it also is, is, is not just one, own, one solitary thing. It's something that keeps going and keeps giving. It's something, it's, it's random, the random acts of kindness, but those are real acts. And those are the acts that make a difference. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Liz. Um, very deep and insightful viewpoints you shared with us. It's interesting, as you said, that, that kindness is as a tool for education, serving as a framework within which we teach. And nurturing kindness in educating our children, our youths, and our institutions. Thank you for sharing with us. I'm sure we have questions. I've seen quite a few comments in the comment box, but please, if you have specific questions, kindly post them in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen so that we take them as we go into the next session. Please type your questions in the Q&A chat box at the beginning of the screen. Now we want to move into a plenary session. In this plenary session, we will just be having our distinguished panelists share thoughts, rob minds, and take some of our questions relating to kindness and education. Does kindness have a role? I have introduced Professor Lise Grant, and I'm sure we've all heard quite a bit from her. We have two other distinguished panelists who will be sharing their brief thoughts, and then we take your questions. Let me start with Dr. Maimuna. Dr. Memuna Kadri is a dynamic consultant, a neuropsychiatrist, and a fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. She has almost 20 years experience as a practicing physician. She is a trained and certified rational emotive and cognitive behavioral therapist from the Albert Ellis Institute in New York, USA. She's also a certified trauma counselor and a neurofeedback practitioner. Dr. Kadri has wide experience in psychotherapeutic techniques and has perfected her skills whilst in private practice and working for a variety of organizations. She is a recognized radio and television guest, psychiatrist, and psychotherapist, and she also contributes to articles published in magazines and newspapers. She's popularly referred to as a celebrity shrink. shrink and is a multiple award-winning mental health physician and advocate. She's a medical director and the psychiatrist in chief at Pinnacle Medical Services, a leading and foremost psychology and mental health clinic in Nigeria. A Goldman Sachs scholar, Vital Voices fellow, and Ashoka change maker, a global thought leader, and she has been recognized locally and globally for her movement in the field of health and wellness, especially mental health. She's an alumni of the U.S. State Department International Visitors Leadership Program and also of Aspen Fellow. Her driving force is to live, to learn, and to impact generations positively. When not working as a physician, she loves to tour the world, work on disruptive innovations, and talk fashion. Dr. Maimuna Kadri is a life coach, an innovator, and she is married with three lovely children. Please welcome with us, Dr. Mehuna Kadri. Good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening, depend on the part of the world where you are joining us. I'm going to stand on the existing protocols. Um, thank you very much to the First Bank Group and of course to our Honorable Commissioner and likewise, uh, my lovely panelists. I'm kind of saddled between two professors. It just means that when you are in, in between two professors, I'm also in that process of becoming a professor, hoping very soon. And then of course, um, this topic um, is quite very, very important right now, 
globally, not only for Nigerians, but for everyone in the world. You know, um, growing up, and even if you didn't learn those words, I do understand that if you have a child in school, a niece or a nephew in school, somehow you must have learned about the five magic words, which is, please, I'm sorry, pardon me, thank you, excuse me. So we should definitely have a six magic word be kind. We do know that kindness is not just a way of life, but kindness is life itself. And kindness, compassionate people are the reasons why we not only survive, but we are thriving in our different, of course, spheres of life. Who needs kindness? Every one of us. We are over 374 people right here on this platform. We all need kindness. Where do you give kindness? Kindness anywhere, everywhere. In fact, one of the quotes I love most is that give kindness to everybody you meet every day because you do not understand their challenges. You do not understand what they are going through. So anywhere you are, kindness is very key and kindness is very important. When do you give kindness? You don't have to wait for a crisis. Kindness can be given even at the least expected time to anyone and any, any way. Why kindness? But my question is, everybody wants to know why kindness, but I would rather go with why not kindness? Why not kindness? Because if there's no kindness in our society, we do understand that apart from the global pandemic, Nigerians are faced with insecurity, insurgency, banditry, kidnapping, increase in rape cases. You know, there's so much that we are currently even facing. So why not? Not kindness, because when we have more people that are kind, compassionate, all these will reduce. But the role of kindness in the education system is exactly what we want to nip in the board. Why not kindness in schools? When we know that kindness is, is infused into our educational system, it benefits everyone, the teachers, the students, the parents, because in the school setting, we have the consumers and we have the customers. Every school knows that their customers are the parents, not necessarily the children. The children are the beneficiaries and they are the consumers. So if kindness is infused in school, that will reduce bullying. That will boost self-esteem, self-worth, self-confidence. That will reduce, you know, that will um, uh, boost interpersonal relationship. That would, you know, bring about understanding other people's emotions. And of course, my area of expertise, it will reduce depression. Depression doesn't just affect only adults. Depression also affects children. In fact, we have seen cases whereby, you know, we have nine-year-olds that are depressed and suicidal. So why wouldn't we make sure that we have kindness infused in schools and encourage everybody to, you know, spread kindness on a day-to-day -day basis? So it's very important. Somebody, um, mic is on. I don't know whose mic is on, but okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for showing us kindness by muting your mic. We are truly very grateful. So education starts from everyone, starts from the unborn to the born and to the adult. You know, because if, you, if women go to the antenna, what do they tell them? You know, eat right, listen to good music, to exercise right, all that they are getting educated and they transform it into the unborn child. We know that there are neurodevelopmental issues that come with children that are even yet unborn. So education is very key. Then COVID-19 happened. What, what happened with COVID-19? Lockdown. We found our children more on the virtual school learning platform. The commissioner said so, the CEO also said so, helping over 1 million children to come in virtually. We also understand the remote working from home. And children at that point, some of them were in a hostile environment, in a toxic relationship, because their parents weren't the kind of parents they actually thought they were. And that exposed them to so very unkind and friendly home front. Yes, schools have opened, children are back in school, but what can we do differently? As a current Aspen um, Institute fellow, my first op-ed I wrote in that, in, uh, uh, as one of the things we must meet up, was to use teachers to help Africans, young people 
in managing their mental health. I never knew I would be called on board this platform to talk about the role of kindness in education sector. But I spoke to my mentors and I said, can you imagine my uphead there's already an institution that is trying to make sure they lobby the government to get kindness into school. And who are the first group of people that we need to help us, you know, infuse this? Aside from the policymakers, the teachers are the low hanging fruit. They are the people that are already there, the resources we can leverage on to help them, to teach them, to be able to, you know, um, utilize the skills they have been trained to you know and, um, uh, make kindness a norm in the school. And of course, when that kindness is infused, it doesn't just only rub off on the children, it rubs off on the, on the parents and it rubs up to the total society. SPAC is what first back has us already put in place. But as I'm rounding up, why it is start promoting um, an act of random kindness, I would say seeking purposeful and realistic knowledge. And how do we seek purposeful and realistic knowledge? By helping us, making sure kindness is infused in our schools, and of course, everybody benefits. Let's end with the acronym for kindness. K is keeping them safe. We have to keep the children safe. We have to keep our environment safe. An unsafe environment, you can never promote kindness and compassion. That, that is true. So that K, we must make sure it is nip in the bud while trying to infuse this in our school. I is inspire these children for greatness. Everybody needs to be inspired. Some of, some of the time when you see children, you're asking them who inspired them, they don't even pick their parents. Why would your child pick you? Why would your child be picking Nancy Mandela who is late? Why would your child be picking Justin Bieber in America who doesn't know that you exist? We also need this kindness, compassion to inspire them for greatness. And it's non-judgmental listening. Nobody wants to be, ever be judged. Non-judgmental listening just means that listen to understand what the child or the person is going through rather than responding. That is very key, that is very important. D is don't criticize, don't judge, don't be apostolic. We are in a society where we throw the words around. Uh, God is in control, this is, don't be apostolic. When you're showing kindness, you shouldn't even do that. Don't criticize, when you criticize, you will not make headway. The end here is nurture them for greatness, nurture their curiosity. There's so much in the educational system that we need to put in place. When you nurture curiosity, you get to get the best from these children because they are future, they are their future, they are the legacy we want to leave. And is emotionally present. If I teach you here, you are a parent here, you are a staff of Fed Bank, you are an ordinary citizen in whichever country, Nigeria and everywhere, please understand that being emotionally present is very important in showing kindness because what you don't have truly you can never give the first s is sensitive be sensitive to people don't just blot out things you know without filters think before you say it when you are sensitive it's easier to show kindness and compassion and the last s as nigerians if i don't say this it's obviously i mean a member of the UAR or another country. The last S is spirituality. Spirituality is also very key. In depicting kindness, it's not just about compassion. What talk is cheap. You need to also walk the talk. When you are more spiritually minded, it's easy to, to, to replicate minus. So as I round up, please understand that kindness, first thing, be kind to yourself before you can show kindness because what you don't have, you can't give and ensure that you're emotionally stable and bankable so that when kindness is what you are exhibiting to somebody, it's easy for you to understand it and it's easy for you to give it. Thank you very much. Wow, wow. Thank you, Dr. Maimuna. Quite a bit to chew on you shared with us this morning. Can I ask, please, this is your acronym, the kindness. If you could just try to tap it, tap it and you know, post it in the chat box so that our viewers can, you know, see the breakdown of the acronym. She has dimensioned it. You know, interesting, interesting. Please send your questions to you into the QA chat box. We will take them shortly. Next, we have another professor, as she said. We are 
bestowed with many professors today. He's a friend of the house, but I'd still like to read his biography. Professor Ken Ameshi. So Kenneth Ameshi is a leading scholar on sustainable business and finance in the global south. He is the chair in business and sustainable development and director for scaling business in Africa at the University of Edinburgh. He's also an honorary professor of business in Africa at the Graduate School of Business, University of Cape Town in South Africa, and a visiting professor of strategy and governance at the Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University, Nigeria. Kenneth's research interest currently focuses on sustainable finance, financial market reforms, and governance as well as on sector level policies for sustainability and sustainability strategy in organizations. Since the year 2015, he has significantly contributed to developing the intellectual foundations of Africa capitalism, an economic philosophy for the development of Africa and championed its mainstreaming in the global academia. Besides teaching and researching, he works closely with the business and governments in Africa, Europe and Asia. He leads executive capacity building engagements and consultancy projects in broad areas of sustainable finance, sustainability strategy, leadership, ethics, and governance for multinational corporations and institutions. Please welcome with us, Professor Kenneth Ameshi. Thank you, Temitokwe, and uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or evening where you are. Um, so in my own case, I, I think um, I'm blessed amongst women, right, in that sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, well, and it, it comes across to me, you know, we have a view on, on kindness, which is very, very positive and very benign and appears seamless, right? So what I want to do in a minute is to move away from that framing of kindness and begin to problematize it in order to enable us also engage with it in a much more critical sense. Um, if I go to the meaning of it, I mean, the meaning has, if you look at the dictionary meaning, it's been espoused in, in many ways. And I like the one that talks about being generous and helpful, and also thinking about other people's feelings. But one can move back a bit and also think about the word kind and also how it can be interpreted. You can look at it from a selfish perspective and say, you can talk about one's kind, my own, you know, people who look like me, people who share things in common with me. So kindness in that sense can also be a space for selfishness, right? Kindness um, cannot play in the devil's advocate here and depending on how you want to stretch it. And you can also look at the, the etymology of it, the, the beginning part of it, the kind, right? Which can also be linked to kindred. And I suspect some of us might relate to that from an African perspective, the, the notion of kindred, uh, which in itself can be a good thing, but can also be problematic in a society um, like Nigeria. And not in the sense that Nigeria has many ethnic groups, but also the fact that Nigeria has colonial systems that do not reflect our indigenous systems. I'll give you an example. Um, and some scholars have looked at this in the case of the two publics. If I commit a crime in the city, right, I'm likely to be handed over to the police. So let's assume I live in Lagos. But if I leave Lagos and go back to my village, my village, my, my, my kindred, they won't be able to, they won't be happy to release me to the police, right? So in that sense, one can say kindred is also an expression of kindness of some sort. But in that case, it in a way distorts what we are suggesting here as a way of looking at kindness. Then the other point to consider, uh, I think Liz also talked about in terms of compassion. So it's about inviting people into our own suffering. And if you look at it from a human psychology perspective, self-preservation is the first thing we like to do. It's, it's kind of being natural as well. So we walk away from pain, we gravitate towards pleasure. Even plants themselves gravitate towards light. So these are natural instincts. And which then helps me to question the view that kindness may come to us naturally. And also the view that um, uh, kindness is built around altruism. 
And the altruism in this case, I'm, I'm questioning it. Is it also an expression of selfishness? Because as Liz mentioned, right, um, we gain by being kind to others. Are we necessarily doing it because of others or because of ourselves, right? So in that sense, when kindness does not pay us or does not reward us, would we be would we be kind again to get involved in it? So, um, and then it leads me to the question whether what we have had so far is not an idealistic version, an aspiration, so to speak. But we need to come back to where we are, right? And how do we make the conversation realistic? How do we, um, so, is selfishness not, not the, the, the reality we encounter on an everyday basis? So that kindness here then becomes a way of swimming against the tide, which in itself can be an uphill task, especially when you look at, at it from an organizational perspective. If I think of First Bank, for example, when I think of kindness there, am I thinking about the individuals, the employees themselves, who are not necessarily First Bank, or has an, can an organization like First Bank have the ability to express kindness, right? So when the people in, in First Bank live today, would, would that entity in itself be able to replicate kindness in case other employees come in? I think it becomes problematic and we need to separate kindness at the personal level and kindness at the organizational level, which then leads me to the point that kindness is also be, being a critical friend. And that critical friend means that I'm able to tell you the truth. I'm able to also critique you when I think you're not doing the right thing. And I also like the idea that it's about feeling of other people. And it takes me to the core of what we are doing today. I mean, it's your uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Week. And one of the key things about corporate social responsibility is not just about philanthropy or the giving side of things, but it's also about firms reducing their negative impact on others, on stakeholders, and enhancing their positive impact. But in order to do that, you need this kindness we are talking about. So if I think of it in terms of what First Bank does as an organization, I can also ask you to say, list your negative impacts, right? You can list your positive impacts, you know, it's very easy for us to celebrate the good things we are doing, but you also have negative impact. So how is this act of kindness also addressing those negative impacts you have on society, other impacts you have on your customers, impacts you have on your employees, or even the environment. Think about first bank investments, whether in fossil fuel or some of the things that might be affecting climate change. To what extent can the pursuit of profit allow us to be kind in that regard? So which leads me to the, 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 the key challenge around what I may call compassionate capitalism. Compassionate capitalism in itself is to a large extent constrained by the dominant framing of markets and capitalism. And for me, this is a major challenge for education. I think that's why I come back to education here. So kindness can be an output where schools, um, our educational systems can help us rethink the kind of capitalist system we have. To what extent can the education system um, have curriculum or curricula that will be able to address or contribute to the realization of compassionate capitalism, where we then challenge what we have because some of the actions we, 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 we pursue today are not necessarily uh, because we are bad people, but it's also, can be in, I would to a large extent argue that it's systemic or you know, it's a system level problem. We are good when we leave the organization, but when we walk into the organization, we need to obey the rules and regulations of organization. And rules and, and, uh, of organization to a large extent that are founded on the dominant framing of capitalism. In order to dismantle that, we need to go back to education. And that's where I think education here is not about certificates, right? Because it's something we, we, we like a lot, we show certificate. Um, but it's about um, culture building. I think that's the, the literally meaning of education in German. The culture, but how do we be the culture that will enable us be the kind of organizations that would reflect the kindness we have in mind? On the other hand, kindness can also be an input into the education system. So on one hand, it's an output in terms of how it uh, helps to correct capitalism. Um, but both Liz uh, and uh, uh, Memuna have talked about kindness being an input in terms of preparing the 
uh, the, the, the environment for education, for learning, because when, where, where kindness exists, then it helps learning and growth. So uh, I guess schools can be much more accommodating. And if you bring it back to the case of schools in Nigeria, I ask myself, uh, you know, we are moving away from public schools, public schools in terms of government schools. Many people now are going to private schools, but are these private schools really businesses for social good? Or are they just there because of the money they make? So to what extent are the schools themselves implicated in the negative um, aspect of, of the capitalism we have today? How can the schools themselves be part of the compassionate capitalism? So what I would want to end on is the view that as much as we want to promote kindness at the individual level, we also need to start thinking about institutional enablers to make it easy for people. And this is also drawing from behavioral psychology. Um, when you make things easy for people, you will get more. And when it is institutionalized, the burden lessens. If I ask you now, um, or staff of First Bank, I bet you that your salary or salaries support up to 20 people every month beyond yourself. Right? So, you know, it's end of the month. Before you know it, you start getting phone calls, text messages, people who have. Unfortunately, we can't solve every person's problem. The fact that that stares us in the face can also be a source of concern for somebody who is interested in kindness. But imagine a situation whereby you have in the UK, for example, the national health system, whereby if you are sick, no matter whether you have money or not, you have a system that can take you in. It makes it easier for people. And people are happy to pay their taxes in that regard to have something at the institutional level that can help them manage their um, acts of kindness. So in that case, I'll be thinking about institutionalized collective kindness. How can we have that in Nigeria? And that's part of the problem we have, because when we say the government is not working, literally we have become our own local governments. We have you know, our own providers of social amenities. That in itself would drain any iota of kindness left in us. But how do we ensure that we have the kind of government that will make us um, contribute to uh, um, kindness in the collective sense. So one final point, I think Memuna made it, which is about spirituality. And this spirituality goes beyond religion. It's not about Islam or Christian or Buddhism, but it's also a fundamental question about the purpose of existence. Why do we exist? Why do I exist? At the end of the day, in the next hundred years, we may not be here. First bank may still be around, right? But why do we exist? And if that is at the core of what we do and how we reflect on life, it might also help us think more about this kindness and what it truly means for us. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much, Professor Kemp. Fantastic insights. So you said compassionate capitalism. Hmm. And you also have said to us that swim, kindness is like swimming against the tide of selfishness. I think those are very deep thoughts that we need to ponder on. I see quite a few questions that have come in, so I'm hoping now that we can start reading the questions and get our panelists to respond. We will try to take as much as possible before we close for today. Let me start with Professor Lee. Professor Lee, the question is coming, asking, is there a distinctive difference between compassion and kindness? Can you elaborate? Are they the same? Are they different? Thank you. That's, and that is such an important question. I actually think there is a distinctive difference. Um, and coming back to the way that I define compassion, um, and it picks up actually some of what you have said, Ken. Compassion is about the noticing, interpreting, feeling empathetic uh, concern and taking action on something on suffering, action to alleviate suffering. So compassion really drives us to think about wh what, what is wrong, as it were. So it, in a sense, it goes beyond kindness because we can be kind, and, um, kind when there's nothing wrong. Compassion asks us to go a step further and think, what is wrong? Why is it wrong? Or why is there suffering? Or why are things not working the way they should? And I think, so I think that's where compassion sits a little bit differently from, from kindness, but they're in the, 
how can I say it? They're in the same basket because being compassionate means that you will be kind. Being kind often means that you begin to check and think why, you know, I'm being kind here, but actually the reason I have to be kind is because something is happening that means that this person or this institution or something is not working right so that was that's how I would define the the differences and call you to think about the noticing interpreting feeling empathetic concern and alleviating suffering thank you thank you thank you for that next question I want to direct to Dr Mehuna and he's asking this is does kindness have a boundary would you say kindness has a boundary such a very important question and um, um, with, with the era of COVID, it's very easy for our boundaries to be eroded and it's a lot of us are who struggling to see, stay, stay sane with regards to, you know, having boundaries that will help us. The truth is that generally in everything you do, you need boundaries because boundaries help you not only to function, stay productive, stay sane, stay more compassionate and more kind to people. Because if those boundaries are eroded, there's no way you will be able to, you know, um, give out to people. Boundaries, not, we, don't, we don't need boundaries just to keep people away. We need boundaries to also stay and revitalize get rejuvenated, get reorganized, get re-strategized. On that basis, you'll be able to know what to do, how to do it, who to do it to and all. So it's key that boundaries are still set. That is why I made that statement that what you don't have, you can't give. And when you have boundaries, boundaries keep you not only physically, but emotionally grounded in, in that space to make you productive, not only staying alive, but also thriving. Thank you, thank you. President, Professor thank you. Kenneth, let's move on to you. So people are wondering, you know, can kindness backfire or become, become inimical to the party offering the kindness? Do you think so? Or what would be your take? Of course, I mean, <laughs> kindness like any other thing can backfire, right? So. And it's, I think uh, it was the least I was talking about in terms of interpretation. So it, there's a bit of sense making that goes into it. You may want to be kind to someone and the person misinterprets that kindness. Um, I saw a comment um, in the chat where somebody says in the Southeast of Nigeria, which is uh, predominantly the Igbo ethnic group, um, people see kindness as a form of weakness, right? So uh, in a way it's socially constructed. So you may also find this whole idea, um, I mean, you can also, in, in certain cultures, you may find gender issues that are linked to the fact that, let's assume a man decides to give a woman, a, you know, some leeway or even to respect her as a person, and the culture might start to reinterpret it in a very negative sense, as if, um, you know, you are now sold out and, and so on and so forth. But kindness, yes, can, be, can mis misfire, or backfire when the other person who is meant to receive it. I like the quote from Shakespeare, the kind of Merchant of Venus. He says about two things happening, the giver and the receiver. Where there is miscommunication, misinterpretation, it can also be seen as being patronizing. And some people don't like it. But again, I think it's also about how the person showing the kindness goes about it. Some people will struggle to be anonymous donors, right? they would like to be acknowledged. Maybe that's part of their sense of kindness. And it goes back to the point I raised earlier about altruism. To what extent are we doing it for ourselves and what we benefit from it, as opposed to what others will gain from it. So in a nutshell, I would say, yes, it can backfire. But the other thing is also, what do you do when it happens? Right? How do you manage that situation? How do you um, navigate around it? And there is a role for communication. If you feel you have been misunderstood, go the extra mile to clarify and at least make the other person comfortable. In doing that, you are also showing um, extra level of kindness. That's the way I would look at it. But whether you succeed or not, there is also a place to have peace in your mind that you have done your best. 
you can't control every person's behavior or attitude. And uh, Memuna, as, um, as a psychiatrist, my other question is, you know, you can only control what is in your, in your control. Uh, how I think and how you think, you know, is beyond, <laughs> can be beyond me at times, right? So um, we accept what we can change and what we can't change, we have to live with it. Thank you, thank you for that. So it won't stop us doing the right thing. I, I wouldn't say so, we keep trying, yeah. <laughs> Liz, the next question is for you. So you know you talked to us about the science of compassion. Someone wants to know, what do you think are the factors that prevent humans growing compassion to others? Yeah, another excellent question. Um, and, and I think it comes back to actually what all three of us have, have talked about um, in different ways. And it's a it, part about fear and about setting boundaries that are about othering as opposed to setting you know having boundaries that allow us to flourish and others to flourish so it's about the sort of um being fearful of the other and that may be fearful because of anger greed um anxiety that the other will become more dominant um fear that it, there will be a, a misunderstanding so often why compassion and kindness doesn't it doesn't flow across is is in is because the space in which it can the space between has become filled with things that are quite bitter and all, some of those are very visible but sometimes they're very invisible we don't even know why we don't respond to another or why an organization doesn't like another or why we're we're fearful for another and we can't we, we're not allowing ourselves to notice effectively or interpret effectively so i i would say there's a there's a number of answers but i would say that fundamental answer about why compassion doesn't flow is about the the spaces that have been either socially created and constructed institutionally system spaces or spaces that we ourselves have constructed in order to on the one hand we feel that we're keeping ourselves safe but on the other hand we're trying to um ensure that someone else doesn't doesn't have what we have or doesn't get what we're what we're getting does that i hope that helps but it's only really touching the surface of something much bigger yes i think that will suffice thank you Dr. Memuna, Memuna, rather, back to you now. So we talked about education and you know teaching our children. Someone wants to know how does aggression in teaching affect children's performance in school? Aggression. It, I think that is already the world is already aggressive enough. So <laughs> by the time you are saying using aggression in teaching our children in school, you're definitely not going to get the best out of these children. Um, likewise, those of us that were beaten um, as children, rather than our parents negotiating with us or dialoguing with us, we've all now been seeing you know, studies and um, researches telling, saying that you know we are uh, we will encounter more issues than children that, you know, um, negotiation and dialogue and all that um, is helping us. So aggression in teaching in school shouldn't be. You can say, you can say aggressively teaching on a particular subject, but using aggression, how you going to, don't, let's not forget in the school system, we have the visual learners, we have the auditory learners, we have the kinesthetic learners. So using aggression to teach in school, how do you, how will you expect children to um, go along? Different children from different backgrounds, you have like 20 students in a, or children in class, one teacher or two teachers with regards to a teacher and a deputy teacher. So aggression in, in teaching children in school, it shouldn't be the order of the day, but teaching students to understand teaching them, holding their hands, being compassionate, being kind, because the truth is that some will lag behind, some will go ahead, some will be in between. So aggressively teaching, definitely that, or teaching, using aggression to teach will not, will not really work. Let me give you an example. I currently in our facility, we currently have nine teenagers between the ages of 13 to 16 that are depressed and suicidal. In fact, three out of these nine have, have attempted suicide twice. 
And to, uh, because this question just hit me, you know, taking me back to what we are dealing with. Out of these nine children, about four of them talk about the way they are being taught in school is not helping them. Because when once one, two, three people in classes, we understand, we understand, the teachers will move on. Not whether they move on or they are not moving. And these are children that are slow learners, but we, are, we also understand that social inclusion is also very important in, with the children in, in, within their normal age group and in, in an environment that will promote that togetherness. So it's key that as a teacher, you are a teacher and a parent at that point when the children are with you. Hello. Okay, well, I guess something happened here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So, yes, yeah, so it is very key as a teacher, knowing fully where you are not only a parent, a teacher at that point, you are also a, a, a parent. So it's good when you are in such an environment, you promote that warmness. You promote that togetherness. You promote that compassion, that uniformity, that kindness. In that way, you get the children to obey more, listen more, come out with good academic performance as against aggressive teaching uh, in schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ken, yeah. I have a question here for you. It says, okay. can kindness bridge the gap between the rich and the poor? And how best do you think those in power can use kindness to rule the people? Tough questions they're asking us today. Yes, I can, I can, I can understand, yeah. So, <laughs> um, before I come to that question, right, let me touch briefly on, on the question you asked me Mina, about aggressive teaching or aggression in teaching. The point I would like to, I would draw attention to another context, which is the business context, right? So, and if it comes to the idea of um, aggression in itself being uh, negatively constructed or framed in the school setting, why should it be allowed in the business setting? So if you look at First Bank and similar organizations, you often hear about aggressive targets, aggressive marketing, aggressive expansion, aggressive this strategy. And the business, the business world is full of what you may call unkind words. Think about headhunting. Why do we, you know, why do we use such words, right? Um, so again, there is a, a place for education in terms of sanitizing the, the education uh, and the education space. Well, that education also needs to fit in into what we do in organizations. So if I now go then to the question of the rich and the poor, um, we are rich. One is rich not because it's, it's not completely dependent on one's ability. Um, a Dangote, for example, we need other people to work with him to grow his company and the company is employed. So the, 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 the rich can be sympathetic to the poor and kind. The poor can also be kind to the rich because that you are rich doesn't mean you are at peace with yourself. So kindness in that relationship is one that would recognize power relations. Power relation in the sense that because we are rich, we can control people to do certain things. So getting uh, controlling people in that sense, uh, we may get the results we want, but are we truly happy? Would you want to be controlled because of the resources we have? And there is also something uh, which happens strangely in our society, where through religion, we have been, we accept the kind of inequality in society where we start with the fact that all fingers are not created equal. So that in itself gives us a way of legitimizing inequality. Or we think God has given to this rich man, therefore, you know, there's no problem, we can all benefit from his riches. So if it's framed in that way, then it's from even a religious perspective, obligatory on the rich to ensure that the poor are taken care of. But when that does not happen, then one can then challenge the notion of kindness in that regard. So I think going back to the question, I would say it's all about relationship. The relationship between the rich and the poor, the, the rich can help empower the poor because at the end of the day, poverty is only but lack of freedom. And what I sense is it's an unfreedom. If the rich person can help the poor to come out, to be more free, to be freer in a sense, 
I think uh, that would be a, a true act, uh, act of kindness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Liz, I have another set of questions for you. So people want to know if kindness is learned or endowed. And they're asking now, as we look at, you know, in the educational space, how can we consciously drive kindness in our schools? And then should there be a curriculum that kindness can be attached to? So multi-pronged question. Thank you, uh, indeed. Um, I think kindness um, is, is both something that we can learn and, and we learn by seeing it in others. We learn by modeling it. Um, we learn from our parents, we learn from our organizations. But I actually think, as I was trying to say in the presentation, that kindness is innate in us. I think humanity wants to be kind. Uh, it's coming maybe back to spirituality as well and our faith. There is something within us that is kind. And often the reason it's not being allowed to flourish is because structures and systems um, and even cultures are um, holding it down or pushing it to the side. So the answer to that first part is it's both. Um, and the real learning, the real opportunity is to recognize the innateness of kindness and compassion. The fact that we do, as a common humanity, want to care together. It's what allows us to thrive. It's actually what has allowed us to get to the 21st century. If it wasn't there, um, our whole societies would, wouldn't be here. But then coming Coming into the, that question of how do you teach kindness and compassion, um, and is there a curriculum or do we do we develop? I think two things. Come, I think com compassion and kindness. There is a narrative about compassion and kindness that is good to 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 share to learn. There is something valuable about telling the stories of kindness. Stories change the way we are, and stories as part of our curriculum will make a difference. The second part of that is that there's something that in every, in all the way that we teach, in, in how we teach, we kindness matters. So teaching aggressively doesn't model kindness. Um, and therefore, even if we're teaching physics um, or economics, we can teach it with a we can teach it with a spirit of graciousness, a spirit of listening, a spirit of kindness. But I want to pick up Ken's Ken's point and, and my own point as well. There, we need to be careful about the conflict that's within organisations. We can't promote kindness and then be functioning in a, a in an unkind way to the planet or to ourselves, um, or, or within the education system. There has to be coherency. In, in what we do as well. Um, and I think it's when we get the coherency, the organizational culture of kindness, the modeling of kindness, the, the spirit of kindness in, in small acts and the wise compassion. And I want to emphasize that word wise, because I think there's a wisdom about kindness and compassion that is so important. Compassion is not, and kindness is not about saying yes to everybody. It's not about giving everything to everybody without questioning it is about ha having a wisdom and that wisdom comes from believing that we are equal together and equal for a purpose for life i hope that answers some of the question i think so i think so thank you so much i want to ask a question of um dr maimuna she said, uh, the question here is, how can we consciously drive kindness and awareness in our school? Mm, brilliant question, I must say. Um, a lot is being deployed. We do know that um, under um, civic education, under teaching values, that is where we have some of these words, um, kindness, compassion, and all that. Um, 
And we all also know if we are true to, our, true to ourselves, our education curriculum in Nigeria is outdated. And it's not only in Nigeria, <laughs> it's most part of the world because what you have been taught in school, when you come out, the reality is almost completely different. Hence the reason why people are looking for the skills to get themselves there. So driving compassion and kindness in schools, that can be infused. It can be part of um, um, the value system, the what we call um, things like uh, um, the motto, things like uh, mission value, vision, you know, things that will help the school to know this is exactly where we are driving at. We started here, we are not yet here, but we are driving at it. In my op head that I posted on the platform, I, I also talked about the fact that when I said teachers to help our African young people manage their mental health, you must give solution. Two very classical ways of doing that is using the World Health Organization, what we call MHGAP. MHGAP means mental health gap, meaning um, um, uh, teaching, using um, training teachers to that are in non-clinical setting, how to help children, adolescents, young adults to be more mentally aware, be more intentional, help them build self-esteem, resilience, and of course, you know, self-confidence and self-worth. The second aspect of that training is, is mental health first aid. It's just like the CPR. When somebody falls down where we are right now, where you are right now, if you know how to do CPR, you quickly be giving the chest, from, you know, uh, uh, pressing and you know, uh, mouth breathing and all that. But the truth is that if somebody is having a panic attack or is having anxiety or crying uncontrollably, you know, what do people do? That is where kindness and compassion comes in. So training them aside from the school putting that policy in place in driving compassion and kindness, having teachers being trained as mental health force aiders, that will also drive kindness and compassion. By September, we are planning to train 500 teachers in, in, in Nigeria for free on mental health force aid because we already have the curriculum. And uh, maybe something we could share after this, we can talk about it because we do understand that when teachers have that power. It's easy to get these children to go back home and replicate what they have been taught. And of course, parents get the drift and society is a ripple effect into the society. So kindness and compassion can be driven into schools using those platforms, MHGAP, mental health force aid, and of course the school sticking to their values and their vision and mission statement and ensuring that that is the, the Employed, you know, as we go on uh, with regards to our educational system. Thank you very much, Dr. Maimuna. Very insightful. Thank you. Someone was asking about celebrating kindness in our schools so that we can create more awareness amongst the children from a tender age. What do you think of that? Is that for me? No, sir, I'm still with Dr. Maimuna because you know we're talking about it now. Obviously, uh, Professor Meshi, if you have thoughts on this as well, I'd like to hear. So, uh, please, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> yeah, so someone was suggesting age. can we celebrate kindness in school so that we create the awareness for our children from a tender age? Obviously, we should have a World Kindness Day. We have everything, World Water Day, World Environmental Day, World um, Health Day, World Mental Health Day. Um, today is World Hepatitis Day, by the way, for those that don't know. So why can't we have a World Kindness Day? And that can, we can depict it in so many ways, verbally and non-verbally. Uh, Professor Lee shared exercise on how to exhibit kindness. It can be planting a tree in that way. You no, know, the thing about kindness is that it gives a ripple effect into every other aspect of our lives. That's the thing. So if you celebrate World Kindness Day, this year it may be plant a tree today. That means we are promoting, you know, uh, afforestation, reducing climate change related issues and all that, environmental uh, pollution and all. We, it can be another way of co a community service. So the thing is that we truly need a World Kindness Day. Maybe we can start our change.org and start signing and get this up there where we can get 
more people to uh, push and lobby to say, we need a World Kindness Day for just this empathy, compassion. We all need it. Nobody can thrive amidst chaos if there's no kindness and compassion for the love run and people around us. So we truly need the World Kindness Day because the earlier we cocate that, the better. Thank you so much. A last question for Professor Mishi. So I'd like to know, someone wants to know, how do you remain kind regardless of your social status since kindness requires humility? Hmm. <laughs> that's a good question there, right? Honestly. Um, that's a tricky one. But again, it goes back to the point I was making in terms of the purpose. Why do you want to engage in kindness? And um, kindness, yes, it's about humility. Um, humility in itself can also be uh, an expression of kindness in, in relation to other people, because humility requires that we treat people with dignity, with respect, with understanding, at least. So, and humility is not being subservient. The way, same way also we are now saying kindness is not just giving in into whatever request that comes your way. So it could also be um, the ability to, I think I like uh, leads uh, construction of wise compassion, you know, knowing what to do at each point in time. You, that wisdom matters, balancing. Otherwise we are dragging too many things. And uh, I was reading a Harvard Business Review article that talks about the power of saying no. Um, because sometimes we think no, saying no is negative. If if you are if you are pressured, if you are overloaded, there's no point taking on, taking on more, because that will be a disservice to yourself and also to the person who might be receiving that value. So uh, I I see kindness and and um, humility coexisting. There's nothing. I mean, the whole thing about status is is socially constructed, and it's also again about power relation, how we see ourselves in relation to others. And Liz also talked about the notion of ordering. Um, so, but I want to touch briefly to the question you asked about um, kindness in schools. One thing I think we haven't talked about, uh, it could be a blind spot on our part, is the issue of inclusion. Um, because it's also an expression of kindness. Um, think about disabled people. And disability is not often visible. Um, think about people with autism, people with learning challenges. To what extent is our education system, curricula, able to accommodate them? Or is it one that is overly assessed? And in Nigeria, I find it bizarre that uh, at the age of two, you expect a child to be reciting calculus. And we take pride in the sense, oh, my child is two, but he can recite the uh, 12 times table. Well, is that necessary? Why do we want to put our children under those kind of pressure. Why shouldn't we allow them to enjoy themselves? So you find a situation whereby people start school at the age of three, and by age of 14, they want to get to university, right? So are we kind to those children in that sense? Because life in itself, it requires some level of maturity to be able to accommodate certain things, to develop both mentally and physically, to be in certain um, points in our educational journey. So I think the point I'm making there is about inclusion, about being sensitive, and, and also, allowing children to enjoy their childhood, because if we all rush to become adults, I, I think we know that our, our adulthood is uh, to a large extent uh, over-exaggerated. You know. Thank you so much. A lot of food for thought. A lot of food for thought. Uh, unfortunately, that will be all the questions we can take for today. We want to say a big thank you to our panelists. You have really shed light and given us a lot to go chew on and to reflect on. At this point, I'd like to hand over to the chairman of the CRNS week for 2021, um, our group executive of the corporate banking group, Hussein Adewi. You have the floor, please. Perfect. Thanks, um, Temi Chokwe, an excellent moderator. And you were, kind, you were kind in terms of the timing, right? So bang, bang on time. Listen, I am... Um, I was just thinking, I couldn't have wished for a, a better start to a morning. One of the comments that came through on the screen said, we are blessed to have been able to participate in this webinar and actually it couldn't be, couldn't be more accurate. We're actually blessed. It, it, there's a lot of reflection that will come on the back of this. I'll speak for myself personally. Um, and I would like to say thanks to all the panelists and the speakers I, I learned a lot and, and so I, I was going to add something very quickly 
uh, the, the aggression from parents raising kids. So my, my father um, was the negotiation type. My mother was the aggression type. Uh, and so somehow probably end up balanced between, between the two of them. But some interesting concepts this morning, uh, Professor Liz, the science of compassion. You know, I, I never really thought about it in those, in those terms. There's a science to it. And, I, and you said, you know, basically the societies that have more kind people flourish the best, right? And... And, you know, we often say in Nigeria, and again, I, I know the franchise and the footprint that First Bank has is, you know, not just Nigeria, but we often say um, that we, we wonder how we survive with all the headwinds that hit us as a country. And my theory this morning, after listening to you, is that we probably have a lot of kinder people, right? And, and that's how we've survived. Culturally, uh, if, again, if you know a bit about the culture, you will understand you're your brother's keeper. And from a very early age, we're trained to think about people, not just yourself. Uh, and uh, when we talk about spiritualism, I was going to address this comment to Dr. Mimuna, where we're, we're highly spiritual, right? So obviously that's, that, has, that has an effect. But I took notes and I took so many notes, compassionate capitalism. I thought to myself immediately, you said, I thought, isn't that an oxymoron, you know, do, do, especially where you're a banker, you work in this cutthroat environment where can that really be compassionate capitalism? But, but I understand what you meant. And you also said, uh, when you make things easier for people, you get more. Like that, that caught my attention because I've always been a firm believer in saying, even as a bank, when you make it easier for clients to transact with you, ultimately you do a lot better. But in rounding up, um, I was with the CEO uh, yesterday, uh, one of the initiatives, and one of the journalists at the end of it were asking him some questions and said, how much money are you putting in or how much is this going to cost? And he, he gave an excellent response. It wasn't scripted, uh, but he gave an excellent response. And he said, you know, it's not about the money, okay? It's about what we're doing here today. And if every organization in this country did what we were doing today, the society will be completely different. And I think that's where we need to, to kind of round it up in addition to saying thank you, is if every single person was kind, then society would be very different. And I think, um, you know, food for thought, I would thank you. I think we need, one of the kindness days is actually one of the things we're trying to sponsor i don't know if you've seen that come through but ultimately that's one of the things we're trying to get through and, and maybe in a bit later we'll we'll share some thoughts with you around what we think will happen thank you very much uh a great thanks on behalf of the bank and the ceo who i think is still with us and all the colleagues thank you very much to professor liz uh dr mimuna professor meshi uh and everybody else who has joined uh, this morning. We had at one point 380 people, and that really is impressive. So I'll hand over back to you, uh, Tim Tokwe. Thanks, and, and have a great day. Thank you so much, Tosi. So on this note, we want to thank you all for taking out time to join us. We trust you had a useful time, and we look forward to you joining our upcoming webinars. We have one coming up on Friday for our millennials. Please join them, because that's another area, kindness in social media. Otherwise, do enjoy the rest of your day and stay kind. Kindness should be a way of life. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you everyone. As part of the Spark Initiative of First Bank, members of staff of compliance department came together and uh, we selected Gaja Community Secondary School to donate books in demonstration of our commitment to start showing random acts of kindness to people in our community. This just goes to show how First Bank is caring, how we have put our community and our customers first. And uh, really, our expectation is that these students also will adopt this initiative. And if each one will reach one, we hope that 
in taking over this initiative, in reusing the books, they will become great leaders. And we can spread this message to all and sundry. And by this, we hope that Nigeria will truly become the country that we all hope and desire. I am here to represent our community senior secondary school. And I'm very glad within me for this book that you have given us because a lot of students are not able to afford this, this type of book. The books will help us a lot because a lot of students, a lot of pupils, they actually have to go to the library to borrow books. They have to borrow from their neighbors. Now that they have these textbooks, they'll have something to read. On behalf of Gara Community Senior Secondary School, I'd like to say a very, very big thank you to First Bank. Thank you for their investment. Thank you for this test that they've given to us. We really appreciate it.